All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Marcus Phillips, and this talk is about all the things that people get confused about when they're learning JavaScript. Before I start reading that list, I want to frame the significance of this information. So I'm a teacher at a coding immersion school called Hack Reactor, where professional or talented amateur developers come to really dramatically increase their skills in software engineering on a very compressed time frame. And this is the cliff notes of the class we do on the training track for HTML5 DevConf on Thursday. It's a day-long class. That class is a compressed version of what we do in the first week at Hack Reactor. So I get to teach a lot of things in addition to JavaScript, everything from computational complexity theory to database design. And my job puts me in a great position to study people and exactly what the breakdowns are for extremely smart individuals who try to understand various concepts related to programming. Today, I'm going to cover some of the types of breakdowns that we see for students learning the language constructs of JavaScript. We cover JS fundamentals in about four days, so this talk is a, just a fraction of what we've mapped out. But it is enough to help you either learn or teach this one aspect of the developer's workflow more effectively. There are some really valuable conclusions to be drawn from noticing how consistent the patterns are in how students get confused. The conclusion you should draw as a teacher after seeing so many people get stuck by the same handful of concepts is that your teaching style has to be radically different from the traditional model that we're all familiar with. So this room here is very much like the traditional classroom model. There's hundreds of you, for, for one thing. Uh, most of you are not expecting to be called upon to uh, demonstrate that you understand what I'm saying. Uh, these are features that we're used to in a traditional learning model that conceal the fact that nobody understands what you're saying when you're up here. Nobody. It's really true. Uh, but if you know that everyone is getting confused in the same way, you can forgive your audience for not completely tracking on what you've said so far and start taking responsibility to provide them the lesson rather than provide them merely the information. So uh, for example, you, sir, with the glasses and uh, the Kindle, I think it is. You have a beard. Yes, you. Um, what's the point of my talk? <laughs> what would you guess the point of my talk to be? That's a reasonable guess. That's a very reasonable guess. Uh, this is the first two paragraphs of my talk. The first sentence of the first two paragraphs told you what my talk was about. Um, it's good that you could hear me and that we're all having fun sort of talking back and forth, but the, the activity of learning is much more difficult than hearing correct statements. So the first point I want to make The first point I want to make is that the problem of feeling out of sync with an in-person lesson is universal. Almost all of the students, almost all students anywhere, start with a creeping sense that their question might not even pertain to what's being said in the lecture. They worry that, in fact, their confusion is probably totally misguided and would be an embarrassing waste of time to put words to. And I'm not just talking about the struggling students, I'm talking about all of them, regardless of their background or their aptitude, nearly without exception. So at Hack Reactor, we are very fortunate to have a room full of really remarkable people. And the most impressive programmers we can find, budding programmers, our, our reputation allows us to take the pick of the litter. Uh, so now, in this room, you have people like aerospace engineers who got tired of their jobs, and financial advisors, and quants, math teachers, uh, computer science undergrads who noticed they didn't have to spend $100,000 to write software and came to do the program. So imagine that room full of intellectual rock stars. You might think that they must all, each of them, be very comfortable, just naturally willing to say, hey, I don't get it, whenever they don't track on something. I mean, after all, they are in like less than 3% that gets accepted. So it's clearly not their fault. They have every reason to be confident in their smarts, but like I said, the problem of feeling out of sync with an in-person lecture is universal. So 
The fact is that putting words to technical questions is one of the most difficult and important things we train our students to do. And the process of going from a nebulous uncertainty to a clear statement of what you don't get is a crucial part of not only the in-person lesson, but to thinking itself. You frequently need to clarify a question to yourself, even at home in front of Google, before you have any hope of effectively finding an answer. So that's a big part of what we work on. The students who feel they need to skulk off after lecture and piece together the shards of what they heard, those students will fall behind. The only successful strategy for keeping up in a class that moves at the speed we do is to accept that your personal confusions have relevance in the room and that you are being tripped up by something everyone struggles with. Of course, this conclusion only holds in classrooms where the lecturer is actually aware of and sensitive to this dynamic. So they need to do a lot of work to create that environment. But learners have hope. It turns out there are things, the things that you are confused about are universal. At the school, we've seen quite a few of them, and uh, we've had this surprising discovery. 90% of everything people ask questions about and get confused about can be listed in an hour-long talk. So that's what I'm going to go through today. I don't have time to recap all the lectures that led up to those questions. No doubt you've done a lot of research on your own, so you're coming to the room with certain questions. But just knowing that the problems are out there and that they're not unique to you will go a long way towards confidently asking questions of your teachers and your colleagues when you might previously have thought them to be dumb questions. For those of you in the room who already understand the concepts underlying the confusions in my list, this talk is especially for you because if you're ever called upon to explain a concept in a new, to a new recruit on the team or maybe you wanted to write a blog post explaining how to understand a particularly nuanced piece of JavaScript, this is a long list of heads up about what the most likely confusions your audience will have. Understanding the concept very well does not prevent you from confusing a junior JavaScripter that you're mentoring. To emphasize this point, teachers, I want to make clear that it, as a teacher, it's not sufficient to simply state a true, a true fact in front of an audience. Learning doesn't happen that way. It, I'll say this again. So the accurate announcement of some fact is insufficient to get a room full of people to understand the concept. This is because listening to a lecture is really hard. If, has anyone here watched lectures on YouTube? Like hour long, you, instead of going to a lecture. Right. So I'm curious, how often did you pause the lecture? Right? And how often did you go back and rewind and rewatch a certain part? Because it didn't make sense necessarily the first time. <laughs> Just like now, probably you're fast forwarding. Um, but my point is that hearing factual statements does not constitute learning. So there's a process of digestion that's required. The listener is almost certainly imagining something totally different the first three or four times that the lecturer describes a true fact. I know this because I call on people ruthlessly. Imagine that top student of top students, the sort of, you know, hot shot. I really love calling on this girl. When you call on that person and they say something that's equally detached from your actual point, as what everyone else said, it proves to the whole room that even she has no idea what I'm saying. So without ado, here are the things that an audience learning about JavaScript, objects and property access in particular, is most likely to be thinking. The things they're most likely to be thinking that you mean the first three times you say it, instead of whatever true fact you actually may be said. Due to the format of this talk, I'm going to be breaking my own rule when it comes to repetition. I definitely will say things fewer times than most people need to learn the concept. But since you're most likely watching this on video and can rewind and fast forward at your leisure, you'll probably prefer to see me cover a greater number of topics than to see them covered in more detail. Okay, so let's talk about objects and property access and where people get tripped up. It's kind of interesting. If you have an object and you want to assign a property to it, it's as simple as using brackets 
and passing a string in between the brackets. When you want to access that property later, you do the same thing. Uh, this would alert black. Dot access expands into bracket access. So if you've seen dot access to an object, it's really an alias for the same thing. Now, this might seem uninteresting. Maybe you've accessed objects many times before and thought that it was unchallenging. But here's where people get confused. It's kind of some subtle and surprising ways that they maybe are imagining you mean when they first learn property access. If I say property equals color, so I've got some variable, I'm allowed to put that property, that variable, in between the brackets and do a lookup. But I can only do that with bracket notation. People forever want to use a dot followed by a variable name. It's really odd, or at least it was odd to me because I'd been programming for long enough that it was a bit of a surprise the first few times I saw it. But I've seen it a million times. Um, furthermore, if you're going to use the variable name, you can't put it in quotation marks. <laughs> this is the inverse problem. It is not allowed to pass a string to the bracket access that has the same name as some variable in scope. So as a reminder, this is the correct formulation for property access or the alias dot notation. And one thing that will lead you out of a lot of confusing spots is mentally to substitute a bracket and quotation marks in place of any dots, or vice versa. If you see bracket and quotation marks, you can turn it into a dot. There are a lot of things you can't mentally transpose with a dot. At this point in a lecture in a classroom, I would call on someone and ask, what can't you do with a dot? And they would almost invariably go, oh, I, brackets? I, so, regardless of how clear you hope to be, um, these are the types of things that I can expect will get confusing. So in this case, the string that you're passing in needs to be a string, so it needs to have quotation marks around it. You are not allowed, for example, to simply type out the word you're, you're curious about the property of. This would fly if you were using dot access. It will not fly if you're trying to use bracket access to, app, to access the C-O-L-O-R key. In this case, it's going to do a variable lookup on color, which is not existent and throw an error. Here's where it gets interesting. What do you think it does if you pass a string in that happens to look like an integer? Nothing interesting happens. It accesses a property like always. People are starting to think ahead. People who are at least somewhat new to JavaScript are starting to think ahead to uh, arrays. And they're starting to think, well, but arrays are different. We're going to see in a minute that arrays are really not different. One interesting thing here is you're allowed to omit these quotation marks with anything that stringifies to the string you're interested in. So in this example, the second uh, access to the zeroth element, the, the key zero, is being automatically stringified. You can do the same with the first access. You can sort of invert these quotation marks, like so. Or you can leave them both off. In all three of these examples, all four of these examples, quotations on both, quotations on either, or quotations on neither, uh, you're doing property access. The trick is your interpreter is running to string on whatever you put between the brackets. And that's not necessarily intuitive to people who are just learning the language. So now here's an interesting question. If I switch this up so that it's an array instead of an object, here we had obj equals curly braces. And here we have array equals square brackets. What, what do you think will have changed about this property access? You've raised your hand. I never call on people who raise their hand because they think they know the answer. I'm curious, actually, whether the room at large, unself-selected, knows what's going on. You there in the corner, how do you think uh, it changes matters because Arrays, I'm, I'm accessing properties on array rather than on, on an object. I'm sorry, uh, this fellow here with a hat. 
sure. No one is sure. Let me just assure you that no one is sure. <laughs> now, interestingly, and I don't mean to pick on you, honestly, I, I, I think everyone in this room has a valid, I hope it's been clear in my thesis, that everyone has valid confusion about this topic. I don't mean to pick on you, but I said maybe 11 sentences ago that arrays we will see are no different. Nothing is different about this property access. And one of the most difficult things to teach people out of that I've seen is that they add complexity to the topic. They believe that there is more going on than they understand, and they say, well, but arrays, you know, something, in fact, everything you've learned holds true, and it will work just like an object will. So this array allows me to access uh, properties, either to set them or to get them, using string or number of keys that will be turned into strings, just like an object does. And secretly, we can, uh, we can assume that arrays are going to be more efficient for certain use cases. In general, I'd kind of like you to ignore those, those uh, optimizations that the interpreter gives you. Unless you're really working on the performance of your app, um, it's not necessary just to parse and understand a program to know all of those differences. So this is just property access. This is an array, remember. What does this new line of code do uh, in the stripy tan shirt? What does this line of code do? This line the value number of flavor. Oh, that's awesome. To flavor, what do you mean to flavor? Uh, yes, okay, so you use the word element and then you corrected yourself or else you thought that element was relevant. It's not, it's not adding an element, but it is adding a, a property, as you said. So we're adding a property to this array at the key flavor. This is just like a, an object. The caveat being, when we talk about array elements, we tend to be talking about the numbered indexed keys from zero to some limit. So this is just property access as well. It's totally allowed. When you alert it, it does exactly what it would have done had it been an object. One interesting characteristic of arrays, though, is that they have a special magical property that tells you how many numbered elements there are from zero to the limit. That length gives you that hint. We all know that this is a magical property. Out of all of the things I'm sort of insisting are simpler than you might think, this one I'm actually saying is as complicated as you might think. Let's just come back to how it works sometime in the future. Magically, the length property works. That's one of the things that arrays give you that are unique from objects. But it's nice to know that the magic, at least so far, is limited to that one rule. So this would alert one. We're allowed to use brackets for the length property. I think the interesting thing, the interesting observation here is that we're allowed to do it because there's nothing special about the length property. It can be accessed in all the same ways as all the other properties. I mean, I say nothing special, and then I made that comment about all the magic. I realize that's ridiculous. So let's say this array, instead of being an array that has only the zeroth element uh, written, or the first element, I suppose. It has two elements in it. Length now magically changes, even though no one has done manual property assignment to length to make it correct. It now alerts two. There's a common mistake in JavaScript, and in fact, it gets debated for a long time, I think, in people's careers. They argue as to whether or not you should use one type of for loop or another. So let's just, let's just examine what the characteristic differences are uh, and how people get confused about them. So this loop has instructions to literally start at zero and climb to some limit. The, the instructions are encoded in there. If you're, if you're at all familiar with C-like languages, this feels natural to you. If you log i, it's going to log two numbers, not strings, a zero and a one. Why would it not log strings? I just told you that all the keys were strings uh, with the red hair in it next to the aisle here. Okay, that's fine. Wasn't paying attention. That happens. Like, you tune out. You have to write something down. You, you were totally writing something down. How could I expect you to know what I was talking about? <laughs> 
It's ridiculous. So let me ask you again. Why would it log two numbers rather than two strings? Now the keys, remember, are always strings on an object and on an array. They are all strings. So why is it logging numbers? It's only logging the number properties. Uh, not actually quite right. It's logging numbers. We're logging i. We, we are not even interacting with the array yet. Right? We're asking it how many times to do it, but that's about it. Other than that, we are not really interested in the keys of the array. So I want you to read this style of block as being literally just a, a set of instructions for how to proceed, like it's procedural code. It's practically a while statement with some extra cruft around it. By contrast, the for in construct actually does some interesting things. It collects a list of all the keys and then iterates over an array of those keys. So in this case, although I'm using the name i for consistency's sake, I would usually call it k, uh, k or key in this case. Because I'm not actually going from some zero to some ceiling uh, numerically, ordinarily. I'm going across a set of keys. If you want to visit all of the keys of an object or an array, regardless of whether they're numbered, you have to use this construct. And that's why. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, let's just say flavor. My mistake. I don't even know what I'm doing up here, to be honest. All right, let's, let's switch this up so it's not an array, it's a function. So I'm just replacing all the arrays, references to array, with fun, and at the top it stops being double brackets. It's now a function. Um, what do you think has changed in my code? What will... What will change and be different and break, if anything, in the red? Yes, yes, you. <laughs> you know, you're turning redder. I'll, 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 uh, I'll alleviate the problem here. There's at least one problem. Functions don't have the same length property. Remember that length was magical? Uh, functions Let's just assume for a moment that they don't have a length property. This is not really true, but for the sake of argument, I want you to imagine that functions don't have an interesting length property. So because we're alerting function.length, it should alert undefined. It'll actually alert zero in this case. But regardless of whether it's undefined or zero, whether the property is just missing because it's not a magical array with a magical length property, we certainly are going to walk across the elements contained within that function. Now one, one misstep that at least some of you are making right now is that you're confusing the contents of the function, by which I mean the key value pairs that are stored on it as an object. You're confusing that notion with the notion of variables in scope in that function, inputs that got passed to that function, maybe even work that gets done in that function. Luckily this function has none of them. The function on the first line has no inputs, no local variables, and does no work. So it's hard to get it confused with uh, the prop to get any of those concepts confused with the properties that are stored on the function as if the function were an object. Centrally, and this is the huge takeaway for anyone coming from another language into JavaScript, this is probably the central takeaway that you will benefit from if you really sort of take it on board. And that is that functions much like every other value in the language, are objects. They have the ability to store properties. That transition I did a, lot, a little while ago and sort of surfed past where I transitioned from array to function, it's very significant that there's no difference in how the property access works. In many languages, you aren't allowed to treat functions as objects that can be interacted with from the outside. You can only invoke functions to make them do work. They can never store properties. JavaScript, this is not true. One analogy that I really like for understanding functions as first-class objects is to think of them as machines. So every machine is itself an object, much like a, a statue is an object and a blender is an object, but a blender has a button on it. I can press the button on the blender and it'll do something interesting. 
a remote control and a, a brick of wood are both objects. But a remote control has a button that if I press it, my TV turns on. Now, I can certainly paint them different colors. They probably have different flavors. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that doesn't mean that the function somehow needs to be consistent in the properties that it has and its behavior. They're two totally separate concerns. So in this case, this would never run because functions don't have the magical length property of arrays. So let's get rid of that code and ask ourselves about this code. For i in function, what can we expect this to do uh, on the end there, looking guilty? What can we expect? How, how will this work? Will it work the same or differently from before? When it was just an array? No idea. Reasonable. Um, if it were the case that functions are objects and can have properties, and the property access is identical for a function as it is for an object, then the seductive choice would be that nothing would happen differently. It would be the same. There'd be no effect. The only thing that might confuse you, I think, about this is that we just had some code that did change and was different. We are allowed to reason about the code that we got rid of differently than the code that I'm examining down below. The code we got rid of behaves differently merely because it relies on the length property. But other than that, my promise is unbroken. Functions, like objects, like arrays, like pretty much everything in the language, are ultimately objects and can have property access. So let's uh, open this function up so that I can fill it out with some interesting aspects. Let's say that it takes an input. And let's say that it does something interesting to that input. What could possibly be confusing about this line of code? My discovery is that there are two very confusing things about this line of code. One, if you are just learning this language, or maybe you've come from a language that doesn't have object literals, maybe you're just learning programming for the first time, uh, or maybe, who knows? Those curly braces sure look like object literals. There's a syntactic ambiguity that it's a little hard to tease apart. The second thing that people don't seem to intuit without necessarily being told is that the body of the function doesn't run. So if I were to run this program as it stands, we would never alert anything in uppercase. That would not happen. In this particular code snippet, that might seem obvious, but you'd be surprised by how many times that is the source of people's confusion. They imagine that just because they see the code on the screen, that means it must be running. That code will not necessarily run until we invoke that function. So let's do it. Let's invoke the function. This is going to alert hi. There's yet another ambiguity on the page. These parentheses are very confusing. If you're new to function creation and function invocation, or if you come from a language where parens are not on function definitions, or something like that. The fact that these two parens look so similar to the ones on the first line is really problematic. When people see the above, they haven't really identified the, the huge significance of F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N. That's a very significant word to see in your program. It means that we're not making any, any code run. We're merely building a machine for use later. And I'll repeat this because I'm positive that this is something that some of you are going to continue to get tripped up about. When you see a function definition, that is to say, when you see fun, c-t-i-o-n, followed by two parens, that is not the same thing as a function invocation. You have to look for some identifier other than function. Other than the token fun, c-t-i-o-n, anywhere that you see a different identifier with parens next to it, that's going to be a function invocation. Now, telling you this in words might not actually help. It usually helps when you're having this problem. Um, it's hard to imagine how you'll find yourself in a situation where this happens, but it happens a lot. 
So I'm going to move this function invocation over to the right side of the screen just to make some room for myself. And I find this next leap really interesting. Because to me, having written JavaScript as long as I have, um, the next transition feels perfectly natural. And I'm very surprised to see that it is not natural to most people. Fun is a variable that refers to the function at the top. If I merely make an equivalent function in line, rather than referring to a variable that has an equivalent function in it, there's no meaningful effect on my code in this case. These two are equivalent. People are very reluctant to invoke functions immediately after their creation, right in line. Those parens at the end of this function, uh, function definition lead people to all sorts of odd conclusions. It's especially tricky to distinguish them from the ones prior to the function body, for example. But something very different is happening. This code does run immediately in line. We could erase the first line of code, and this last line would still work. So let's move on to a rather different example. And this one, this one gets into, uh, depending on how people have used scopes before from other languages or just starting out programming, um, people will frequently want to access variables that are local to some other scope. So what they'll want to do is they'll say, you know what, I really need that input. I need to do something to it for some reason. Their program would be reasonable to imagine they needed access to that information. And they maybe haven't really internalized the complete privacy of any local variables. The input there, that variable is local and private to the fun function, and it'll always be. It's impossible to address that particular variable outside of those two curly braces on the top line. But people try all sorts of things to get access to it. They try referring to it directly, just talking about input down below here somewhere. And then they think, ah, I got it. I'll get, I'll get a dot in there. That'll help. Huh? <laughs> uh, fun dot input has no relationship with input. And this really, this really strikes at the core of one of the things that I think is tricky for people who have not done a ton of programming so far. I personally relate to the feeling of, uh, of confusion that, uh, that these students would have for why people talk about scopes and objects and properties as if scopes and, and objects with properties on them, right? variables in scope and properties on objects, as if they were very clearly and obviously different things. If you're familiar with these two concepts and you use them every day, it seems obvious. Why, how could you get confused? They're, they're used very differently. But this is a very tempting mistake to make. So one thing that I'm not doing a ton of in this talk, because of the constraint of the medium, as I mentioned in the beginning, is I'm not getting a lot of questions from you. But I'd like to make a side note that one of the best ways for me to tune what I'm saying to the audience at hand, if I didn't have insider information from having given a day-long class to this audience on Monday, I would be maybe, I would maybe as a speaker feel insecure that I was addressing the wrong audience that the things I'm saying are too high level or too low level. But I know that there's a significant showing. I can see some of you who are at my class um, right? uh, who need to know this stuff and need, need it uh, repeated by all means. But there's a couple of things I'm not doing in this format that I'm, let's say, doing only a tiny bit. One is I'm not calling on people a ton. The second is I'm not asking you what questions you have or, or where you're at. So I want to take a quick moment. I'm going to keep calling on people in a rare basis, but I want to take a quick moment to take one or two questions so that I can take, get a sense of how much of what I'm saying is really resonating and is exactly what you needed to know and how much of it is over or under your current level. Can somebody ask me a question about any of the stuff we've talked about? So when you traced out the keys in the array object, how come we didn't get like Back here. When we first had the keys here, 
in the for in the loop, right? Ah, yes. What was the question? So in this for loop. Ah, why did we not get length? That's a great question. Another piece of magic that JavaScript supports, and in fact, this is one of those things that you encounter down the line. You can actually ignore this piece of complexity for a long time, and then one day you bump into that. You say, wait a minute. I know there's a length property, and come to think of it, there's a slice and a splice and a push and a two string. Where are all of they? I don't get it. Uh, there's a nature that properties can have called unenumerable, which makes them not visited in foreign loops. And that's about the only thing that you could detect about an unenumerable property, is that interrogating the object will reveal that such a property is exist, exists and is the present. But when you iterate over them with a foreign loop, they're omitted. Yeah? In that same foreign loop, wouldn't it return 0, 1, and placement? Yes, it would. That's just a typo in the slides. So is it the mere aspect that we uh, put assign it to an empty square braces gives it the property, the length, and then the additional? So in JavaScript, empty square braces, uh, or square brackets just at all, whether they have elements in them or not, it's an object literal. It generates an array, much like if you had used a constructor, like the array constructor, somewhat different and perhaps better. But it generates an array that has all of that stuff. The length property will be magic and available from, from the inception of that array. I saw one or two more hands. Yeah. Uh, function has arguments. How come when you do things, you don't see the uh, arguments as a property of uh, a function? How come there is no such thing as fun dot arguments? Is that your question? I know. I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I know a function has arguments like input. Why, when you start examining fun, don't you see something having to do with arguments? When you say examining, though, I just want to zoom in on this question. You said when you. When you examine the object, by which you mean iterate across the properties of the object. So arguments are only really a relevant concept when we're invoking a function. Think of that blender example. When we're running a blender, we have put fruit into the blender. Arguments are a relative notion, are a relevant notion, when I'm operating a blender. I can find out what fruit is in the blender. But arguments are not globally and universally interesting about a given function prior to it ever having been run. If you get a new blender and in, the, in the mail from Amazon and you open it up and you try to figure out what fruit there is with that blender, that's not even a question that makes any sense to you, right? Like, what is the fruit for this blender? Someday you're going to use that blender to blend fruit and the moment of operation gives meaning to this notion of arguments. So for that reason, with, if that seems intuitive, which it might or might not at this point, but it seems like you're nodding, so if that seems intuitive, then it seems wholly impossible to imagine what fun.arguments could possibly mean, in my, in my opinion. Fun.arguments, what, what could I find there, given that information that we just examined? You can see the string input, which is not the value, but just... The name of the arguments. You're curious why we can't find out the parameter list. Yeah, that would be interesting. And in fact, you can find the parameter list, but it's hard. You have to two-string it, and it doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> yes, let's take two more. Scopes. So I tell you what, um, I have a really cool slide that I might, I might have time for right at the end here to show you. It's a visualization of how slides work. Right now we're doing code walkthroughs. Uh, and I'm not doing sort of like in-memory representations of the objects and how they interact, but I do have one for scopes that if there's time, I will certainly get to, because I think that's exactly the next thing after all of the content that I've prepared that I wanted to get to, but I just didn't think there'd be time. Can you uh, define uh, the parameter as a global variable within the set input, like you know, variable input? So within the body of fun, meaning between the two, semi, uh, the two curly braces, would it be possible to say var input equals null or something? Initialize it to null. Or, is that what you're asking? Outside of the function? Uh, you will find as you toy with, first of all, no. And you will find as you toy with that that you don't actually want to do that. 
you don't want to try to get access to things that run, uh, that are available at runtime of a function. You don't want to have access to them globally at all times. Imagine the fruit example again. After the first time you run the blender, is it the case that you want to have access to that fruit from every context other than the blender forever? Until the, what, the next time you run the blender, now you have, you've overwritten the global fruit that's sort of gradually rotting. I love this analogy. <laughs> Uh, yes and no. I mean, you can make them available, but it's not a lot different from global scope. Cool. Okay. So, fun.input, not a thing. Let's, uh, let's change the example a little bit. Let's make this function one that takes no inputs. It just alerts some string, predefined string. So I'm trying to simplify this function a little bit because it's going to make it easier to, to discuss what we're about to discuss. And this is, this is something that um, you know, I, told you about the, I told you about the applicants that come to the school and, and, and how impressed and thrilled I am to get to work with them. Universally, they do this next thing wrong in their application phase. If, they haven't, if they're not familiar with JavaScript in particular, they do this wrong. They want to call a function, and they can do that. They know how to call a function. They put parens next to it, and it runs. Great. And then they decide they want to do it later. They want to set some sort of a delay as an example of callbacks more generally, right? They need to pass this function as a callback to some other system. Let's say set timeout, right? And they do this. They put their code, they wrap their code in set timeout because they read the documentation and it says put your function here. <laughs> And this is one of those cases that I was talking about where the invocation and the definition of a function are very different. The invocation and the reference to a function are very different things. So the first problem you might notice here is, orange shirt who didn't get to talk earlier. Yeah, so that's the second thing I was going to say. So I'll get to that. For, I'll say the first thing I was going to say, there's this semicolon is going to create a syntax error. Because it's not a statement. I don't get to put statements in the middle of an argument list. The inputs to a function. I don't get to do that. So I'm going to get rid of that. And then I run into the parentheses. Because as the code is currently written, the order of operations very clearly states that we need to figure out what fun evaluates to so that we can pass that value to set timeout as the first argument. Quick check. What do we really want to pass as the first argument to set timeout? Fella, burly fella with the blue shirt. Yeah, no, but in front of that other burly fella. <laughs> but not behind you. You're the actual one. In front. No, the guy in front. Oh. That's right. <laughs> What's the question? I don't remember. <laughs> what do we want to pass as the first argument to set timeout? No, but now I'm really talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> the first argument is set timeout. What is it expecting? A callback function. Yes, a function. What are we actually passing? Function invocation. Pretty close. The result of the function. The result of the function invocation. What do you think the result of this function invocation is? A teal shirt. I don't know. So looking at the function above, although I didn't tell you this, functions that have no return statement in them just return undefined. It's as if you're saying, oh, yeah, I, I finished running, but uh, it's kind of nothing. So undefined comes back from this fun invocation, and we're actually passing undefined, the value undefined, which I should probably come back to at some point. That's kind of weird. There's a value, like, like other values, like seven, like the string sheep. Uh, undefined is a value in the, in the language. That value gets returned from this function because there's no other return statement. So we're, set, we're passing that value to set timeout as the first argument. If I really wanted to send fun as the callback, the thing that should happen in the future one second later, I would need to remove these parentheses. What this says is invoke fun later. So as an analogy, just to go back to uh, machines for a moment, if I had a machine that was capable of doing things later, it's pretty simple, right? It's got like an alarm clock on it and a little arm. And when the alarm clock goes off, it pushes a button. 
on whatever machine it's holding. And I said, hey, do later machine, right? Set timeout. Here is a uh, blender. I give it a little blender and I tell it, wait for a second. It would hold onto that machine and press the button. If what I really want to do is pass one of these un unoperated machines, and I want to pass the result of having run the blender, which would be a smoothie, I want to pass a blender that's going to do some work. In that case, I need to be passing a reference to the function directly. Are there any questions about that? In the middle. How do you pass arguments? What's that? How do you pass, How do you pass arguments? What a great question. That's my next slide transition. How do you pass arguments? It, it seems like if you don't get to write the parentheses yourself, because that clearly means something very different, that means do this now and then whatever the result is, pass it along. How do we ever get to define the invocation time inputs? So there's a number of ways you could do this. Probably the most accessible is not to pass fun at all. Instead, pass a different function that calls fun with the right arguments. So I'm going to pass, let's say, an anonymous function, or really any function, but I'm going to use an anonymous function, that should call fun. So the first thing I'm going to do, well, I did it all at once. I thought that was two transitions. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, in sum total, is wrap the entire block of code that I want done in an anonymous function, and I am now passing that function object as the first argument to set timeout. That function object has one instruction, one line of code in it, one statement. It's going to run fun. And if I had, if I had uh, inputs that I wanted to offer, I could do them in this, in this way without fear that my anonymous function was going to run immediately. Why won't my anonymous function run immediately? Um, mustache. Why, run Why will my anonymous function not run oh, okay. immediately? It's just a declaration. Sorry? It's a declaration. It is a declaration. What, what is the difference between this and what it would take for it to run immediately? Well, exactly. So there's two parens that I showed you earlier and I said sort of trip people out sometimes. If you were to put two parens after the, last, the curly brace on the last line, that anonymous function would invoke immediately. You would obviously never want to do that, but that's the difference between the two patterns and what it is you're going to be doing differently. So that's it. It would be great if that's how I ended. I just waited for everyone to walk out. Uh, that's it. I really appreciate your coming. I'm going to switch over to the uh, scopes visualization because uh, I think that it uh, at least will answer your question. I think it's quite interesting. But for everybody else, um, if you found these topics interesting uh, and you're interested in learning more, the class that we're doing on Thursday for HTML5 DevConf training track uh, has been sold out for a long time, but if you come talk to me, I can probably uh, get you in anyway. Um, if you're interested in just more about these types of materials and what we're doing with it, uh, you can find me at Maracas on Twitter or, uh, or via the Hack Reactor website. Thanks for coming. Oh, sure, yeah. Give me, uh, give me nine minutes while I do this thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give me nine minutes to finish my talk. If you're interested in talking to me, you'll have to wait nine minutes. But you should sit here so we can talk about scopes together, because I really like this slide. I stayed up till like four.
that's pretty crazy. Yeah, if you tell Nathan about that, he will write it down and make it better. Thank you. Yeah, I, he was sitting there. Nathan, this guy has something you would love to see. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't want to see. Okay, scopes. We go quickly. What is a scope? A scope is a data store where variables hold values. It's a lot of key value pairings. It's a data store that in many ways shares nature, shares um, its behavior with objects. The two seem quite similar. They are similar because they can both store key value pairs. What are the keys in a scope? In, in an object, the keys are the property names. What do I mean when I say a key of a key value pair in a scope? This fellow with the gray. Yeah. The variable names are the keys in the key value pairs uh, in scope. So there's, a, there's an analogy there. Uh, you create a new scope once per function call, and this is what our visualization is going to make clearer. Scopes are not created on a per function basis. They're created on a per function call basis. Calling a function 100 times means there are 100 scopes. Calling a function zero times means there are zero scopes. With only one function, neither of those numbers is the number of functions that were in the system that I'm describing. So we're going to see that. Scopes nest, so when you, um, when you talk about a variable that is not in a local scope, uh, it's found in, it's searched for in the next scope out. And we're going to evaluate this code together. It's been colored with respect to what function body it corresponds to. So there is always a global scope that's just present at all times. I'm going to start my execution uh, in this scope. Uh, ignore the, the red dots. I didn't expect to give you the rest of this slide. It doesn't mean anything. My execution, uh, my lookups are going to start in global scope. So the first line of code runs, and we try to figure out uh, what hero is. We run a random hero and assign it to some variable hero, and it gets placed in there. So some random variable named hero, or some random variable, uh, some random string is generated, girl, and gets assigned to the key hero in that global scope. And then we declare a function, and that does much the same thing. And we start running our function. Notice we did not run any of the lines of code inside the function, as I mentioned earlier. We don't have to examine the body of the function until it runs. So we're now down at the bottom here. We're about to log whatever story comes back. And this, this function generates stories of the format boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl, right? But it picks random words. So the first thing that happens is a scope is created because we ran a function. At that moment, we start running the first line of the function, which seems to be a variable declaration and assignment, which creates a more tightly nested variable in a more tightly nested scope. Then we, uh, we create a, a win function. This is what happens that's in support of the hero. That's a local variable as well. We create a fail function. That's present as well. And then we run one and then the other and then the first one. So let's generate that array of output mentally and fade this out because we are going further down the call stack. So the faded out ones are, are us walking through the call stack. We're going to run this individual line in order to figure out what that array is populated with. That creates a scope because we're running a function as usual. It is even more tightly nested than the previous one. Our execution uh, you know, interpreter context goes to this very tightly nested scope, and we create an action that is a local variable to the very innermost scope, and then we concatenate them all together. So we see girl trumps CEO is the result of just compiling together all three of those lookups. Girl falls all the way out to global scope, because that's where we defined our hero. Trumps is a local variable, so it does not need to fall through. CEO is in the middle scope. This string is generated, and we come back out. I'm now graying out that function scope because it is garbage collected. Now we run the second one. It creates a brand new scope, 
It runs the first line, creating a local variable, much like it did above. All of these are pretty much what you'd expect at this point. The same things are happening. As I gray these out, it means they are no longer relevant. The interpreter garbage collects scopes, or at least variables from scopes, that are inaccessible. The reason the, the interpreter is able to clear up that memory and forget whatever it, whatever it built when it built that scope and the associated variables inside that scope, the reason it can forget them is because there is no way for me to access any of those variables to wonder what value they could hold. If you examine the code, you'll see that no function can refer to any, no function that is currently in existence can refer to the variables that were in that scope, that were created for that scope. So now we're done with the first story, and that gets logged. We run the second story, and the same thing happens all over again. Hopefully, this shows you the difference between the idea of function scopes being associated with function invocations, as opposed to function scopes being, as some people initially imagine, associated with functions themselves. Now, if I'm not keeping up the next speaker, which I must be, nope, I got one more minute. The last thing, and the thing that trips the most people up, is closures. A closure is a scope created by calling some outer function that remains available to any functions that were created in that scope. I realize that's a mouthful, but this is the most condensed true thing I could think of to tell you. And now I'm going to give you the lesson rather than just the information. Even after the outer function scope that it was created in returns, that scope remains in existence. So in this example, there is an inner function and an outer function. The inner function gets assigned to window. The outer function is being invoked immediately. I call the inner function three times. And the interesting thing to observe here is that this i variable, which was a, uh, bound to the value zero to start, this i variable is accessible to this function for the rest of the life of this function. As long as I can get access to this function, the language will not clean up the key value pair for this variable. So the fact that I have access to check even after my outer function has returned, it returned right here. It was immediately invoked and the interpreter moved on. The fact that I still have access to it on the global scope, which is currently being referred to as window, means that every time I call check and every time I is incremented by the check function because it has access to it and it can edit it, it's mutated in a lasting way. So I would love to clarify and repeat and uh, refine my statement of this, of this definition, but I would be, uh, it would be rude to the next people. We've gone at least one minute over. Thanks again for staying late. I will go just outside the room if you have more questions that you'd like to ask.